Hello and welcome to the second video in our ecology unit. This one is titled Ecosystems and Their Interactions. Throughout these slides, we're going to take a look at and remember a little bit about food chains, food webs, and more specifically how energy can flow through our ecosystems. Before we dive too far into it, we need to get some basics down here. Ecology, we know, is a study between the relationships of living and non-living things, biotic and abiotic factors. So while we're going through these slides and really anything that's related to our ecology unit here, you want to think how are these things interacting with each other and how can they affect one another in both positive ways and negative ways, depending what's going on in the ecosystems itself. This is a really important slide here that we can look at that goes through what we refer to as the different levels of organization. All of these different interactions, they interplay and interconnect with each other, but they can also have different effects depending what's the scale and what the level we wanna look at and regard them within. So we start there at the very bottom with that little, that big deer fellow there uh, at the individual stage. In some places you'll see this referred to as either an individual or the organism level. Either way, it's talking about just one of any certain species. That's the individual. I'm an individual human, you're an individual human, but if you put us together, then we're slowly getting a population of humans, or in the case of this picture, a population of deer. It's a group of all the same species in one area. That's a population. Now, if we were to take all the different species in the area and throw them together, that's all the different types of plants and animals together interacting in the same environment. We call that a community. If you look at the picture here, you can see that there's like a little rabbit, a little beaver, an owl, a tiger, or some sort of cat animal, one of those big old moose guys. But then you also have like a dead tree and some bushes and grasses and things like that. Communities are that interaction of all living things in a certain area. Once you start throwing in those non-living abiotic factors, you've moved up to the ecosystem level. That characteristic of abiotic factors in our system, that is that defining characteristic that jumps us from looking at things at a community level up to that ecosystem level. So if I wanna think about it this way, an ecosystem is the smallest level of organization where you see biotic and abiotic interactions occurring. Will they occur at the higher levels beyond it? Yes, but this is the smallest level. It's the first stage that we can see it. In the picture there, you can see that we have a couple of bears along the streamline. They're probably going after those salmon. Bears like salmon. So I wouldn't be too surprised if that's what they're fishing up there in that river. So again, ecosystem, that's the level where we have biotic and abiotic things beginning to interact for the first time. Beyond that, we get to our biome stage. We can think of this as a slew of different ecosystems kind of strung together over a large geographic area, and it's dictated by the type of climate that dominates that area and type of primary vegetation or our producers that inhabit that area. That's how we kind of define these different biomes. And if you want to think about it this way, here in Pennsylvania, if you look outside, it looks glaringly different to if you were to look outside in the middle of Arizona. Both of them are very different locations. Even though we're on the same continent, geographically speaking, we're very far away. There are different climate factors, different temperatures and precipitation patterns that they have to deal with, different types of plants in both of those areas. That's how we get these biome categories strung together. At the top, when you get all the biomes kind of strung together, that gives us our biosphere. It's the largest level of our organization. It shows us how us as a global system is functioning in its totalitarianism, if you will. If you want to steal a little bit of a word from history class there. And it's totality, I guess we could say. So these are our levels of organization. And depending what you want to look at or what you want to research, you're going to want to look at one of these levels or maybe several levels to see how some sort of positive or some sort of effect is affecting these at these varying levels. Here again are the list of the levels of organization. For the purposes of our class, you're going to want to make sure that you're able to place these in size order from either smallest to largest or largest to smallest if you were to see that somewhere on a quiz or a test. Again, these are words that we've used 
already in this class, and they're just being kind of reiterated here on this slide. Biotic factors, they're the living things in our ecosystem. There are animals, there are plants, you and I, the rabbits outside, the squirrels on the ground, your bushes, the trees, anything that's living is a biotic factor. Abiotic factors are the non-living things like temperature, precipitation, water, salinity or salt level, uh, pH, uh, anything from our biogeochemical cycles that are cycling through our systems like carbon and oxygen and water and nitrogen and phosphorus, all those are abiotic factors uh, that come in and affect our systems. Larger ones like wildfires and floods and things like that, those are factors too at a much larger scale. All these interplay uh, and allow our ecosystems to change daily. You'll notice on the first bullet point here that ecosystems, they don't have clear boundaries because of how biotic and abiotic factors can change daily. I like to think of ecosystems that are right next to each other. It's having kind of like a transition zone. You'll never have it where you're walking through a forest ecosystem, walk right into a wall where there's a door, open the door, walk through it, and you're all of a sudden in a grassland. You're going to see a slow transition, almost a blending from like that forest system into that grassland system because of how these biotic factors and abiotic factors work with one another. When we used the example in class of Yellowstone National Park, or when we did the gizmo activity, you'll notice that some of the things spoken about in either the Yellowstone example or the gizmo activity on ecosystems is that some of the wolves were leaving the park and attacking things like sheep and the farmland adjacent to it. So our behavior patterns are kind of predator prey relationships to some of these animals they're going to cause some of these biotic living things to move out of their system in the surrounding ones. Not too far, just enough, but that shows us how, depending what's going on, you're going to see a blending of maybe different ecosystems at those uh, certain barrier ranges. And that creates really interesting, almost like sub-ecosystem areas where you're going to see some blending of some different organisms that you might not necessarily see. That's why those transitional zones are really exciting within ecology. If we're talking about energy flow and how things get their food from one thing to another and how it can kind of affect everything within our levels of organization, we need to recognize that all living things ultimately get their energy from the sun, either directly or indirectly. Personally, I'm not a plant. I can't do photosynthesis. I can't do that. Plants can do photosynthesis because they have the chlorophyll in their cells that allow them to take that sunlight, do some chemical reactions that you'll talk about in biology class next year, make its own food and produce oxygen for you and I to use to survive. But remember, we can't do photosynthesis. We need the plants to start off the whole process of photosynthesis so we can get that sun's energy into our system. So we can kind of get that movement of energy then from the plants to whatever is going to eat the plants, ultimately up to you and I so we're able to survive. Yeah, Mr. Sunflower here, he's all happy because he knows that plants do photosynthesis because of the sun. Now, there are some bacteria, and you'll possibly learn this next year in biology. We might talk about it when we're doing geologic time. There are some bacteria that are able to capture the sun's light and the sun's energy and make its own food through chemical processes that are similar to photosynthesis, but slightly different. But for the nature of right now for this video, you just have to know that plants do photosynthesis in order to kind of start this whole process off. Anything that's able to take in the sun's light, like our perennial flowers or sea grasses or cacti or trees, they're called producers. They are producing their own energy from the sun. And that's essentially what the word autotroph means. Any organism that automatically makes its own energy from the sun. If we were to break down the word autotroph, auto means automatically, troph or trophic means energy. On the opposite side of that, you have consumers. You have organisms that have to get their energy by eating other organisms. We have a little floppy-eared puppy dog here. We have Chuck the cow. We have a little puffer fish there and that wonderful little stick figure family. 
all of these different organisms are unable to create their own food because we're unable to produce it. We're not autotrophs. We can't do what plants and these different bacteria do in order to make their own energy. So we have to consume them. Heterotroph, similar to autotroph, trophic means energy. The difference is heterotroph means this is an organism that gets their energy from more than one source. So if we look at the stick figure family, they might get their food from different things. They might eat different types of animals. They might eat different types of plants. So they are having their energy through consumption, through multiple different sources. We can categorize consumers into many different groups. Primary consumers or our first level consumer, they eat the producers. If we look at this picture here, we have the sun. It starts off this whole thing providing us the energy, gives it to our grasses and our different producers. And then the first organism kind of in this step that is able to kind of consume things is our primary consumer. In the example we have here, that's our grasshopper. Building on to that, our secondary consumers, they eat the primary. These, like the example here, are a little field mouse or a shrew. They're the second consumer in the line. Primary means one, then we have secondary. And if we were to continue this out, we have third level or tertiary consumers, like the owl in this picture. Can this chain get longer? Yes, it can. However, that is directly related to how big of an ecosystem you have to work with. Smaller systems are going to have smaller chains. Larger systems are going to have larger chains just because of the availability of food and the level of biologic diversity that are found within each of these ecosystems. So looking at this image again, it starts with the sun. Producers, they take that sunlight in, they make their own food. Then our grasshoppers, our primary consumers eat them, followed by our secondary, followed by our tertiary. It's almost like the transitive property in mathematics here. So we can say that our producers are getting our energy from the sun directly. Our owls, our tertiary consumers are getting their energy from the sun indirectly. That's what that means. We can break down consumers even further, further into four different types. We have herbivores. These are animals who only eat plants like giraffes. Carnivores, they only eat meat like lions. Omnivores are humans. We eat both plants and animals. There are other organisms that do that too, like some bears. Decomposers are a very important consumer in this system. They break down dead organic material and allows for the cycling of different nutrients back into the soil to feed our plants, our producers, so that way they can keep on surviving very healthily. Decomposers, we don't really list within a chain or a food web. We just assume that they are in play at all levels of those consumers throughout the primary, secondary, tertiary, producer level, decomposers are working throughout all of them. So while we don't explicitly list them, we can just assume that they are ever present. Food chains. So again, what do food chains show us? It shows us how energy is trans transferred through the ecosystem in a specific sequence from one organism to the next. This food chain, as you see here, it's an aquatic food chain that starts again, energy from the sun, and it eventually works its way through different producers, consumers, until we finish out with that really large shark at the end at the quaternary stage, or our fourth level consumer. Unlike our grasshopper, shrew, owl food chain, the food chain here for the water is a little bigger because the ocean is so much larger than that we have on land for you know, respect to ecosystems. So we could have that fourth level here. So we have large sharks within our food chain, within our ecosystem. But we can't just willy-nilly uh, create food chains. There are rules you have to follow in order to make sure your food chain is correct. So remember, here are the big three. First, you need to make sure that your ecosystem, you're focusing on one ecosystem and that all of the organisms present in your chain would live in that system. You're not going to have a rattlesnake, a penguin, a black bear, a flamingo, and a scorpion all in the same food chain. It doesn't make sense. You got to make sure that you have all the organisms in your chain. They would live in the same ecosystem together. Then you want to make sure that each organism is in a correct order, showing what's eating what. If we think back to our food chain that we used earlier today, when we had the grasshopper, the shrew, and the owl, you wouldn't put the owl in front of the grasshopper, because then that tells me that the grasshopper is eating the owl. And that means there's giant radioactive grasshoppers out there, and that's super scary. 
And we don't want that. So you got to make sure that the order is correct. And then lastly, and very important, you need the arrow. The arrow designates the direction in which energy is flowing in a system. So you can't just have line segments. Line segments doesn't tell me much, except it says these two are connected, but it doesn't show how. You want to make sure you have an arrow pointing from the sun to the grass, the grass to that first level consumer, and then there on and therefore throughout the rest of the food chain and food web. Those are our big three rules. So if we look at these food chains that we have here, let's take a look to see if they follow the rules. We have some acorns here that go to the little field mouse, field mouse to the snake, and snake to the hawk. Okay, that order makes sense to me. Would all three of these exist in the same system? Yeah, I could see a hawk, a snake, a field mouse, and acorns living kind of maybe even outside here at Perkiomen Valley. Does the arrow point the correct direction? Yes, it does. It starts with our producer to the primary to the secondary to the tertiary. Take a look at the bottom right food chain here, the sharks and the little plants. Even though it's not ordered in the same way, the arrow is showing us where the energy is going. So even though we don't have it written left to right, since we have it in that reverse direction, it's still correct. We have the plants on the right there, and the arrow showing us that the little fish will eat the plants, followed by the medium fish, followed by the big fish. So that makes sense. Food webs show us a little more detail. It shows us actually what the entire system really looks like. It's a multitude of food chains. Because, you know, organisms, they eat more than just one thing. If you look at this food web, there's so much more going on. We have multiple producers, multiple primary, secondary, tertiary, third level consumers, all the way up there. We see all these interconnections going on. The one thing I don't necessarily like is that they're line segments and not arrows. I like arrows even in my food web to really show the different directions that energy is going. So if you wanna think about it, a food chain is like a snapshot of one little area. Food web is the entire ecosystem. Food chain is the corner of a painting. Food web is the entire painting. Those are good ways of thinking about this. Here's a very nice Venn diagram that breaks down some differences. Remember, food chain shows one food choice. Food web shows many different choices in paths. It's many links together of the food chain. It shows the entire ecosystem, but there are those two main similarities. They both show energy transfer and both of them start with the sun. So if we were to compare and contrast food chains, this is a great slide to look at for that. Lastly, and the last thing we wanna talk about is just an other way we can kind of organize energy flow to see what's going on in our ecosystem. We call it the energy pyramid or the trophic pyramid. Remember when we looked at those words, autotrophs and heterotrophs earlier on, trophic means energy. So this is the trophic level pyramid or the energy pyramid. If we use this pyramid, we can see at each step from producers to primary to secondary to tertiary, how much energy is transferred at each step and how much energy exists at each of these steps. As you move from the producer level up to the primary consumer level, you're only able to capture 10% of that energy and keep it in the system. The remaining 90% is lost in the form of heat back to the system to be used in some way, shape or form in the future. The laws of thermodynamics state that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only change form. So we're not destroying the energy. Remember, we get our energy from the sun directly or indirectly by the producers. And then eventually that energy leaves our system again in the form of eat heat because our organisms need to do different biological processes to stay alive. When you eat food, you're getting your energy. And then when you move around, you might get warm and start sweating or you start you know, having heat radiating, radiating off of you. That's that 90% going back to the system. You're only keeping 10% of what you eat. So as we move up that pyramid, every step Every time, 90% of the energy is going back to the system and you're only maintaining 10% of the energy from the level underneath you. Why are there so few organisms at the top? That's a good thinking point here. Why there's so many at the bottom, so few at the top? But you know, it makes sense if you think about our chains and how it's set up. 
If we want to make sure that we have a really strong base of the pyramid, our producers, that's where the large majority of our organisms are going to be. So we can get as much energy into the system as possible. As you move up that system, you're going to have fewer animals because you're going to have less energy transfer up. That's why at the very top of the pyramid, you might only still have 0.1% of the energy you started with. And that's not a lot of energy to go around. So it makes sense as you go up the pyramid, as you lose energy, as you lose food, you're going to have fewer organisms near the top of that energy compared to the bottom of the pyramid. That tells me that the bottom of the pyramid is the most important part of the pyramid. Those producers, they're the most important part because without them, the whole pyramid would collapse in on itself. Our ecosystem would not be able to survive. That's why we say that the producers are so important. Not only do they help get energy into the system, but they support the rest of our tropic pyramid. This is a really good example of a trophic pyramid that a past student made on one of the exercises we were doing. This one is specific. It says the Arctic tundra energy pyramid. I want to point your attention to those percentages on the left. That's how much energy is able to stay at each of those levels. When we go from producer to primary, we go from 100% to 10%. Where does that other 90% go? It goes back to the system in the form of energy. When we go from primary to secondary consumers, we go from 10% to 1%. Where does that, you know, other 9%? Or if we make it and think about it this way, that's technically 90%. Where does that go? Back to the system as, you know, heat. That's where our energy goes. And the same thing when we go from secondary to tertiary, 90% of the energy from the step below is back to the system as heat. So, you can numerically see now, as we go up the pyramid, we lose energy. There's not as much energy to go around, so we'll have fewer organisms as we get closer to the top. And that's all we have for these slides. There's a lot of stuff to kind of break down and unbundle from these slides. If you're stuck at any point, you can just go back in this video and rewatch it. Uh, you can check your slides, you can check your notes, ask me questions, all of these things are fine. But remember, regardless of if you are, you know, going through your system and looking at it in the form of an energy pyramid, as a food web, as a food chain, that we always start our energy from getting it from the sun. The producers bring it into our system and then it eventually will work its way to you and I, indirectly, of course. All right, that's it for me. Have a good rest of your day uh, and let me know if you have any questions. Take care.